Here, I love summer. Um, who loves summer? Anybody Ooh. love summer? It's hot. The roads are clear. Yes. Lots of seats in church. Um, you know, it's just a phenomenon. It happens in church plants, and it's a little more noticeable in church plants, but that's okay. I'm glad to have everyone here that the Lord has brought us today. Did anybody watch fireworks on Tuesday? Was it Tuesday or Wednesday? Wednesday. Did anybody watch fireworks on Wednesday? Oh, yeah. Where'd you go? Uh, you, you blew some <laughs> stuff up at home. That's good. I know some of our other members here that... that aren't raising their hands to like to blow stuff up at home too. Uh, anybody else watch fireworks? Anybody hear fireworks? My dog heard them. Yes, the dog, does your dog shake? Yes. We had a dog one time, Becky, that uh, this this dog was, I love this dog. She set the bar so high for all future animals. <laughs> But every year, 4th of July, we had neighbors that would blow stuff up well into the 5th of July. Yeah. And our dog would sit on our bed, the 60-pound Shepherd Lab mix would sit on our bed and shake the whole time until like 2 in the morning. One year, I went down and, and like my t-shirt and a pair of shorts and said, guys, it's enough. I got to go to work tomorrow. I'm done. You got you to gotta stop. Like, dude, it's the 4th of July. I said, I don't care. The 5th of July is a work day. <laughs> right? You, you ever feel like that? But we have some neighbors that uh, this year I felt like I was in a war zone closer than I'd ever felt before maybe my ears are just more sensitive than they used to be but let me ask do we blow stuff up for good news or bad news both both <laughs> do you ever do you ever celebrate with fireworks like bad news do you think in the UK, they're they're <laughs> celebrating fireworks on the Fourth of July, right? Because they lost, we won, so we celebrate, right? And we're declaring with with fireworks, we're declaring to everyone around something that's good, right? Good news, and it's impossible not to see them. Actually, I don't think I saw a single single firework this year. I heard them for hours. Wow, I heard them for hours. Fortunately, the dogs were crazy. They didn't jump up on our bed and shake all day. But this morning, as we continue in Psalms, I want us to consider the two greatest declarations that have ever been made. We're going to look in Psalm chapter 19, news that doesn't need fireworks, news that is so good that um, fireworks wouldn't do it justice. Millions of dollars of fireworks can't do this justice. News that is so incredibly good, a declaration. Just like we use fireworks to celebrate and declare good news. The declaration of the glory of God through creation and through the word needs no fireworks. Turn with me if you have a Bible to Psalm chapter 19. Psalm chapter 19 reading from the Christian Standard Bible this morning. It says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the expanse proclaims the work of His hands. Day after day they pour out speech. Night after night they communicate knowledge. There is no speech. There are no words. Their voice is not heard. Their message has gone out to the whole earth, and their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens He has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom Coming from his home, it rejoices like an athlete running a course. It rises from one end of the heavens and circles to the other end. Nothing is hidden from his heat. The instruction of the Lord is perfect, renewing one's life. The testimony of the Lord is trustworthy, making the inexperienced wise. The precepts of the Lord are right, making the heart glad. The command of the Lord is radiant, making the eyes light up. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are reliable and altogether righteous. They are more desirable than gold, than an abundance of pure gold, and sweeter than honey dripping from a honeycomb. In addition, your servant is warned by them, and in keeping them there is an abundant reward. Who perceives his unintentional sins? Cleanse me from my hidden faults. Moreover, keep your servant from willful sins. Do not let them rule me. Then I will be blameless and cleansed from blatant rebellion. 
May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. I love this psalm. I, I love this psalm because it points us to two ways that God has revealed himself to, to man. It's, it's really, some have even argued that it's two separate psalms. Like the first half is one psalm and the second half is another psalm and they just got mashed together. Um, I don't really buy that. I think they go really well together. But we see in this psalm, we see three clear sections. We see the general revelation of creation, what creation teaches us about God. We see the specific revelation of God's word how God's word points us to the greatness of God. And then last, we see our response, the, the only acceptable response to the two types of revelation or declarations that we've received, the, the declaration of, of creation, the declaration of scripture, and then the only acceptable response. The first thing we see here is the declaration of creation. In verse one, it says, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the expanse proclaims the work of his hands. If you, if you look at that, it's kind of like your, your ninth grade literature class when you were studying poetry. It's like A, B, C, and then C, B, A. The heavens declare the glory of God. The expanse proclaims the work of his hands. So it's kind of like... A, B, C, C, B, A, just like you'd expect in your ninth grade literature class. But what it tells us is that if we look up into the sky, we must acknowledge that there's a creator. That, that there is a creator. And it's screaming to us that the God of the universe is incredible, magnificent, glorious. You know, it's hard to define what glory is. But when we see something that is glorious, we know it. When I wake up in the morning and I haven't slept all night, I've tossed and turned and I get out of bed and I can smell that the coffee is ready. To me, that is glorious. The glory of a sunset. The peace of waves crashing in Anna Maria or Cortez Beach or wherever you go. The peace of the waves. We, we know when things are glorious. Or if you've been outside working in the sun in July all day and you're covered head to toe in sweat because it's like 98 degrees and it feels like it's 112 and then you have a pitcher of ice water waiting for you. That's glorious. While it's hard to define what glory is, we know it when we see it. Do we see creation and just look the other way because we're familiar? Or do we see it as the glory of God, revealed generally through creation? It says, the heavens declare, the heavens are screaming the greatness of God. The heavens declare the glory of God. Of God. C.S. Lewis wrote that nature gave the word glory a meaning. Nature gave the word glory a meaning. The heavens declare the glory of God. The testimony, the, the declaration of God's creation is that there is a God that does exist and he has created all things. And Every person that has ever lived or ever will live, God has revealed himself through nature, through general revelation is what theologians call it. General revelation that God has revealed himself to every person through creation. It says in verse 2 that he reveals knowledge. It communicates knowledge. Day after day they pour out speech. Night after night they communicate Knowledge. They communicate knowledge. Knowledge of God. I have in a note in my margin of what? The question mark. Knowledge of what? What is the heavens? What is the creation communicating knowledge of? It's communicating knowledge of God. Here's how Paul would write about it in Romans chapter 1. He says, 
since what can be known about God is evident among them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood through what he has made, saying that the creation of the world is pointing to the power and the majesty of God. It says, being understood through what he has made, as a result, people are without excuse. All people in all times, past, present, and future, have seen through creation God the Father. And there's no other possible explanation. Because creation screams of the greatness of God. Creation screams of the greatness of God. The magnificence of God. And the next time you see a, a sunset, or this afternoon as you see a thunderstorm rush in, let it testify to your spirit of the greatness of God. God has revealed himself to all people through his creation. At the end of verse 2, it says they communicate knowledge. God is revealed in nature generally. In verse 3 and 4, it says there is no speech yet. Their, their message has gone out to the whole world. Some things just don't need to be spoken. Some things are so incredible that we don't need words for them. Into verse 4 it says in the heavens he has pitched a tent for the sun it is like a bridegroom coming from his home it rejoices like an athlete running a course in context 2800 years ago many people would have been worshiping the sun many people would have would, would have created the sun as its own god the sun god and and neighboring countries near the nation of Israel would have done that as well they would have said that, that worshipped the sun as a god but David the writer of this psalm King David points us to God being the creator of the sun that he has pitched a tent for it and he causes it to rise and fall like a bridegroom leaving his home about to be married I remember the day that I was married August 31st 2002 I could not stop smiling now, I don't think anyone would have said I was radiant, but I could not stop smiling. I had this goofy grin, like, not, not even ear to ear, more like temple. Like, I think it, my, my smile rose above my ears to my temples. That's what he's talking about here. It's like, like a bridegroom coming from his home, leaving his home, about to be married. This incredible day. Or like an athlete running a course, finishing a race, you want to see relief and joy go on the opposite side of a triathlon finish line. Before we had kids, my wife did a triathlon. And uh, the joy on her face when she crossed the line. The agony, 10 steps before the finish line, the agony on her face, because you have to swim, bike, and then run. The agony on her face before she crossed the finish line, just 10 <laughs> steps before, but the joy on her face once she crossed the finish line. All of this, the son, like a bridegroom leaving his home about to be married, like a, a runner completing his course, that's the testimony of God. That's the testimony of the greatness of God. That God is not in the Son. God is sovereign over the Son. That God created all things. And the witness of creation is that there is a God. That there is a God who is altogether glorious, majestic, magnificent, beautiful, wonderful, incredible. Joy to be found. And I would suggest to you that from this text and the text in Romans chapter 1 and other passages from Genesis to Revelation, that all people have some knowledge of God as revealed through creation. The problem is that the testimony of creation, the, the declaration that creation gives to us doesn't persuade us. It doesn't press us to seek God 
more completely and more thoroughly, more specifically. The testimony of creation does not press us toward God because of the sinfulness in our own hearts. Here's what Paul would say in Romans chapter 1, the next two verses. He says, For though they knew God, God had revealed himself through creation. For though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became worthless and their senseless hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, four-footed animals, and reptiles. See, folks, we don't have images, little row idols on our plant shelf in our homes. That doesn't mean that we don't have idolatry that's rampant in our lives. Well, we might not have images of four-footed animals and reptiles like Paul talks about here in Romans chapter 1. We do have idols that are very real in our own lives, and we need to be careful not to worship them. We need to kill them, turn from them and toward God. Because the creation, the, the witness of creation reveals God to us. But in ourselves, we will run from that and we will worship creation rather than the creator. One pastor I listen to says that creation preaches universally, but not persuasively. Creation preaches to everyone, but does not persuade us to run toward God. We suppress the truth of God revealed in creation and run to the created things rather than the creator. We need the witness, the declaration of the word of God. The declaration of the word of God. We need the declaration of the word of God to point us to Jesus, to lead us to faith in him, to give us life. The heavens declare the glory of God. The word of God reveals the person of Jesus and points us to Jesus. We need the word of God. We need the, the witness of creation. We also need the witness of scripture. And we need the Spirit of God to convict us as we study the Word. And beginning in verse 7, David starts this long section pointing us to the value of the Word of God and the life of the believer. He gives, he gives attribute, benefit, attribute, benefit. He does this, this back and forth kind of thing, just like your ninth grade literary, literature teacher taught you about poetic structures. And he starts in these verses, he gives us a back and forth. He starts with saying, the instruction of the Lord is perfect, renewing one's life. It's perfect, without flaw, without error. It's productive for its intended purpose. Not only is it productive, it's complete. It lacks nothing. It's perfect. And the purpose, the, the, the purpose, the intended purpose of the word of God is to give us life. It says it's perfect, renewing one's soul, renewing one's life. Other English translations would say, reviving the soul. Now, I am not the smartest guy around, not the smartest guy in the room, not the smartest guy in most rooms. But I know that things that are healthy and thriving don't need to be revived. Things that are healthy and thriving don't need to be renewed. He says, the instructions of the Lord are perfect, renewing one's life. What that's teaching us is that apart from the word of God, our lives are not healthy, are not in the proper uh, posture, are not where they're intended to be, need to be revived, renewed. We don't, we don't revive and renew healthy things. We revive and renew dead things. Apart from the word of God, we need life. And we can find it in the word of God. He says the instructions of the Lord is perfect, renewing one's life. The word of God will accomplish its intended purpose. The word of God will accomplish its intended purpose. And the intended purpose of the word is to give life to those who through repentance and faith believe. 
purpose of the word is to give life. And one commentator that I read this week, he said, the word of God revives so that we can repent and then we can return back to it. Revive, repent, return. Revive, repent, return. It's perfect. It's complete. It will accomplish its intended purpose. It is lacking nothing. Next, it says trustworthy. The word is trustworthy. The testimony of the Lord is trustworthy, making the inexperienced wise. Because this word is perfectly complete, it can be trusted. It is the only foundation for our lives. The only thing that will last is the word of God. It is worthy of our lives. It is worthy to be the foundation of our lives. And if we find the wisdom of God. And when I say the wisdom of God, I don't mean like six steps to a happy marriage or four steps to obedient children. You know, that's not a sermon. That's a pep talk. Okay? What I do say is that it points us to things that ultimately matter. Not things that will matter for 10 or 15 or 20 years, but things that will matter for eternity. This book is trustworthy, making the inexperienced, the picture of the novice, making the novice wise. It says the precepts of the Lord are right, making the heart glad. The precepts of the Lord are right, making the heart glad. You know, if you say you have a right way and a wrong way, people will hate you. People will hate you. To say that there is a right way and a wrong way, because no one wants to hear that they're wrong. What's right to you and right to me, and we talked about this a few weeks ago, about truthiness. It's a funny little word. Post-truth. The precepts of the Lord are right. They are complete Think assembly directions. Now, ladies in the room, you've probably watched your husbands try to put things together without looking at the directions, right? Guilty. My wife isn't here. I'm going to say guilty. I'm going to own it. I try to look at things. I look at the picture on the front and say, I can do that. And then I've got parts left over instead of following the directions. But he says the precepts of the Lord are right, like just blink your eyes, guys. If you've ever done that, just blink your eyes. <laughs> Luke's sitting here thinking, I'm not going to blink. I'm, not gonna blink. <laughs> yeah. I'm kidding, right? We've all done that. We've all done that. In fact, I worked at a shop, and we were putting some stuff together when I was a teenager. And I was looking at the directions because I was a teenager. I didn't know that men don't look at directions yet. And I hadn't been taught that yet. So I did what I thought I was supposed to do, start looking at the directions. This guy, Jacob, good, godly man next to me, he says, Oh, I don't look at the directions. I just look at a picture and just put it together. Oh, that's so much easier. <laughs> Until we get done and there's a whole bag full of screws that we forgot to put on. But the picture when he says, the precepts of the Lord are right. It's like assembly directions for, for a new cabinet or a, a detailed road map. Like before GPS, when you'd have to go to AAA and have them outline your trip for you. And you'd, every 50 miles, you'd flip the little page on your little trip. <laughs> Uh, trip map, a detailed roadmap that if you follow it, you will get to its intended purpose, which is completion. And here it says, making the heart glad. Making the heart glad. I think there's, I think there's a connection between gladness of heart and completion. Knowing that God's path, God's direction for us will lead us to where he intends for us to be. And following that, not perfectly because we all screw up, but when we venture off, we pull out our map and we get back on the right path. Following God's path for our lives will make our hearts glad. It will not fill up your bank account, but it will make your heart glad. And I'll take a glad heart over. Next, in, in this back and forth, he says, the command of the Lord is radiant. 
pointing to the, the purity and the ability to restore life. He says, the command of the Lord is radiant, making the eyes light up. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The fear of the Lord, the, the, the awe, the majesty, the, the reverence, the worship of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinance of the Lord are reliable and altogether righteous. They're more desirable than gold, than an abundance of pure gold, and sweeter than honey, dripping from a honeycomb. How do we know that things are valuable? How do we know that things are valuable? What other people tell us. What other people tell us, right? Yeah. No, that's, you're spot on, John. We know that things are valuable because someone has told us it's valuable. Now, take a three-year-old child, drop a bag of pennies, and drop, drop a bag of dimes in front of them and say, pick the ones that are best. Which are they going to pick? Which are they going to pick? They might pick the pennies because they're bigger. They pick the pennies because they're bigger, right? But they need to be taught. Dimes would be shinier, though. Maybe. You can shine up. You can shine up. It just depends if it's a boy or a girl. Uh, very good. Very good. Wow, this got deep. What's that? It got pretty deep. It did. It got pretty deep. But just like you teach a child that a penny is not as valuable as a dime, just because it's bigger, we need to be taught the value of certain things one day at a time. And the question here is, who are you learning from, and who are you teaching? I think as a follower of Christ, I think all of us have a responsibility to be learning from someone and teaching someone else. We, we're kind of in the middle. We have someone that we're learning from and someone that we're teaching. We need to be willing to be in the middle. We don't learn and just learn and just learn, but we learn and teach, learn and teach, learn and teach. Just like we had to be taught that a penny is less valuable than a dime, we need to learn that the word of God is more desirable than gold, than an abundance of pure gold, and sweeter than honey dripping from a honeycomb. We learn things experientially. As we experience the character of God, revealed to us in, the, in our day-to-day -day lives. We learn things educationally. How can we learn the value of God's Word? How can we learn the value of God's Word? How can we, how can we discover the value of God's Word? Read it. Live it. Live it. We think experientially, as I read about the faithfulness of God and the words of this book, and then I see the faithfulness of God in my own life. As I read about the graciousness of God and the words of this book, and I experience the graciousness of God in my own life. Most importantly, that when I was dead in my sin and trespasses, he gave me life through repentance and faith. I was given new life, life that mattered. But as I see the, the mercy and the grace of God poured out in the pages of this book to the people of God, and I experience that in my own life, I see the value of this book. I see the value of the words of God that point me to Jesus that point me to the character of God. And I discover that it is sweeter than honey dripping from a honeycomb. Underneath every one of your seats is a honey bear. It's a two-ounce honey bear. I want you to pull it out right now. Two-ounce honey bear. Mine is watered down because I ran out of honey. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's public honey. Public's honey. It's, it's good honey. Underneath everybody's seat is a honey bear. And I want you today 
when you take yours home, when you go home, I want you to place this in a, in a place where you study, in a place where you read, in a place where you pray, in a place where you just contemplate life. And I don't want you to use the honey, although if you taste it, it's really good honey. <laughs> but I want you to contemplate the value of God's word in your own life. It's sweeter than honey, dripping straight from a honeycomb. See, I know that everything I put honey in becomes better. <laughs> right? A cup of tea, better with honey. Better with honey. A batch of cookies, better with honey. Whatever you use it for for baking, if you pull it out of the recipe, it's not going to be that good. You put it back in, and it's going to make everything better. I love honey. Psalm 19 says, Your word is more precious than gold and an abundance of pure gold. It is sweeter than honey dripping straight from the honeycomb. Let this just be a reminder today. Take this home. Put it in a place where you'll see it. Put it on your desk. Put it in your kitchen. Put it by your Bible, by your notebook, whatever it is. But let this be a reminder to you the value, the sweetness of God's word. It says that we're warned by them. We're offered a reward for keeping it. It says, verse 11, In addition, your servant is warned by them, meaning the words of God, the ordinances of God. And in keeping them, there is an abundant reward. Not a reward in terms of money and financial gain, but instead life, God-given joy, joy that is indescribable, joy that is not dependent on your circumstance, is not dependent on the stock market, is not dependent on the weather, joy that is over all of those things. The reward of, of being known completely by God, being forgiven completely by God, and being sent boldly by God. Indescribable peace and joy is the reward for those who through faith trust in Jesus. Lastly, we see the response. The last thing. How, how do we respond? It says in verse 12, who perceives his unintentional sins? Cleanse me from my hidden faults. God's revelation through creation, God's Specific revelation through his word pointing us to Jesus must lead us to repentance. Must lead us to repentance because we realize that even our unintentional sins are an affront before God or an assault of God's holiness. That even the things we do out of routine, not even on purpose, are worthy of death. We must respond in repentance. word of God points, our, points us to the need for repentance and promises us life in Christ those who repent and believe in Jesus and follow him verse 13 he says moreover keep your servant from willful sins do not let them rule me the thought of a willful sin gives the idea of an arrogant rebellion like the child that refuses to listen when you say don't do, touch, sit, whatever. I was talking with a friend of mine this morning, or excuse me, a Friday evening. A good friend of mine was in from out of town. We were catching up on family and life. I see this guy in his family about once a year. And he said to me, he said, yeah, you know, Alexis is giving me a hard time. She's, she's getting in this stubborn phase. She said that we were at the park and she stood outside our van and said, I refuse to get into this van unless it's going to the cat depot. <laughs> oh, 